Tonight we welcome Reverend Canon Dr. Johanna Collicat, Supernumerary Fellow, Psychology of Religion, Harris Manchester College. Welcome, Johanna. Joanna studied experimental psychology and later theology at Oxford University and clinical psychology and later Christianity and the Arts King's College, London. After many years working in the National Health Service as a clinical psychologist, specializing in neurodisability, Joanna moved into the field of psychology of religion as director of the MA program in Psychology of Religion at Heathrow College, University of London. From 2010 to 2020, she was Carl Jasper's lecturer in psychology and spirituality at Cardiston and Oxford Diocese and all the people's advisor. Joanna has a particular interest in the Bible and is currently undertaking a PhD on the visual commentary on scripture. Together with Christine Joins, she co convenes seminars and other events for the Oxford University Center for the reception history of the Bible. Joanna is an Anglican priest serving in a rural Oxfordshire parish. She has written a number of books. Uh, one of them is The Psychology of Christian Character Formation. Another, So Longeth My Soul, a written in Christianity in Christian spirituality. Amongst others, I have a list here. If anybody is interested, we can, I can send it to you on the chat. This evening, Joanna is going to speak about using good psychology for better theology. The talk will look at ways in which psychology might contribute to the discipline of theology, of enhancing transformation transformative theology, making theology humbler, retrieving a heartfelt theology, and making theology kinder. Welcome, Joanna. We are ready for you. Thank you, Violetta. Um, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen now because I have some slides, so uh, fingers crossed that it will work. Can you see that okay? Yes, that's fine. Great. Great. Okay. So my title is Using Good Psychology for Better Theology. And it's a phrase I got from a student of mine who had been a uh, uh, academic psychologist and then trained for Christian ministry. And he said to me, I wish we could use good psychology to do better theology. And I thought that was a good aspiration. And that's kind of why I have uh, continue to think in those terms for a number of years. And I'm going to start by defining um, what I mean by these terms. Uh, so beginning with psychology, what is it? Um, literally, it's the study of the human soul, the suke or uh, the zela, um, which is the word that Freud used when he wrote uh, of this thing that psychology is engaged with. And so if you're a psychotherapist, you are literally a soul healer. And perhaps that language tells us uh, why psychology and theology uh, bump into each other uh, continually uh, throughout the history of Christianity. And they sometimes bump in a friendly way, sometimes in a, a slightly more antagonistic way. The second bullet point is the kind of definition of psychology you'd find in a standard American or English British textbook um, these days, the scientific study of behaviour and mental processes of human beings in interaction with their environment, or in a shorthand, it's the study of people, the way that people think, their cognition, the way that we feel, our emotions, what we do, our behaviour, our actions, and how we make relationships with other people and notice the emphasis on scientific study there's an emphasis on um, method there so if that is psychology what is good psychology and this next slide uh, just suggests that one could ask that question through the lens of the platonic triad the triad um, of uh, the good which is uh, truth 
justice and beauty. So if we think about truth, perhaps good psychology is psychology that has a sound evidence base in methodolog methodologically sound empirical research. And that research could be quantitative and that has often been the tradition. So using um, experiments or surveys, uh, anything that involves numbers and statistics, but it can and has been more recently also encompasses qualitative methods, interviews, ethnographic methods, and so on. Secondly, something about justice, uh, and that is a psychology that is ethically self-aware, that tries to put some boundaries about what it can or cannot do. So a psychology that doesn't set out to be morally prescriptive, a psychology that doesn't exceed its limits by making large metaphysical claims that it has no right to do, or making unwarranted claims of cultural univers universality, which has been a bit of a problem for it in the past, less so now. And thirdly, perhaps the most surprising one of these, beauty. And by that, I mean a psychology that's based on good theoretical principles, not just on empirical evidence, where the theories that we build uh, balance parsimony or elegance with the capacity of the theory to generate interesting research questions that lead us to uh, important new findings. So I've said something about psychology. What about theology? There are lots of definitions of theology kicking around, and here are two of them that I like. One of them is by Alistair McGrath from uh, his textbook of Christian theology. He describes it as systematic reflection upon the God whom Christians worship and adore. And the second one is a, a soundbite from Karl Rahner, who talks of theology as the science of faith. So both of those definitions emphasize a systematic approach to their practice and both uh, McGrath's explicitly and Rana's implicitly uh, locate theology um, in terms of things that we think, we feel, we do, and uh, very clearly in McGrath's definition, that we do in relationship. So that goes straight back to um, the areas of psychology that I identified in the first slide. So if that is, broadly speaking, what theology is, what is better theology, because I'm talking about good theology or better theology. And um, here are some ideas. Theology that has a human connection. This is a quotation from Fraser Watts, who is a psychologist who writes a lot about the interface between theology and psychology. And he says, unless there is an emphasis on human significance and personal implications, Christian doctrine becomes detached from faith and serves no useful function. So something that has a human connection. Secondly, theology that uses good contemporary rather than pre-modern scientific models and metaphors. And that's a point that was argued by Nancy Murphy, a uh, philosopher, um, about the way that we build models in theology. And she suggests that, there, we, that, that theologians have relied on too narrow a range of models to do their work and that we should uh, draw more broadly. And of course, that would include then uh, drawing on psychology for our models and the metaphors that we use as we do theology. And then uh, finally, a theology that has a clearly articulated understanding of its own identity. And that um, Ruard Gansevoort, who is a Dutch practical the theologian, suggests has been a problem for theology and continues to be a problem, that it's not fully clear about its own identity. And he suggests that that is because it actually is inherently interdisciplinary. He says it's the meeting point of various scientific discourses that speak of God. And I could talk for a long time about that, but I won't because that's not the main thing that I want to focus on uh, this evening. Um, something that psychology then might offer to theology 
um, is this kind of um, humanizing tendency and the ability to act as a resource, offering models or ways of speaking of the God whom we worship and know and adore. And I'm going to give four examples and pursue one of them in a little bit more depth. Uh, and Violetta has already mentioned the examples. So first of all, something to do with enhancing transformative theology, something to do with making theology humbler, something to do with retrieving a heartfelt theology, and finally, uh, making theology kinder, and I put an asterisk there because that's the one I'll look into in a bit more detail. And I'm just going to uh, offer just a very few pointers for the first three. So the first one, enhancing transformative theology. Um, there's a lot of work on the impact of uh, psychological trauma and loss on people the importance of the embodied experience of trauma and loss, and not just the damage that trauma and loss and adversity um, causes for people, but the way that it can also be the context for transformation through processes of coping, through the resilience that human beings have, and through uh, a way of throwing our worldview uh, up in the air. Uh, and enabling us to see things in a radically new way. One way that people have used trauma theory and uh, continue to use it, uh, and I've used it myself, is as a lens for reading the Bible. Uh, most commonly for the Old Testament, um, I've used it more um, for the New Testament, uh, looking at it through the lens of the concept of post-traumatic growth and looking at the uh, Bible uh, in terms of both its content as full of trauma and the aftermath of trauma and its form in that the text itself uh, can be uh, challenging to the extent that it can be traumatic for the reader and it can be traumatic if we let it in, in a positive way. Another thing that um, trauma uh, uh, theory uh, draws our attention to, and some of you may be very familiar with this, is, is the fact that we cannot ignore our bodies. When we're traumatized, the impact is on the whole person. And that uh, redirects our attention to the uh, importance of the body in the Christian tradition uh, and the embodied nature of theological accounts of transformation of suffering. Uh, and um, again, uh, one can bring psychological insights into this into accounts of um, the Eucharist, which is clearly the Christian focus for <coughs> embodied transformation of suffering, uh, liturgically speaking. And I just on the, the slide indicated some of the key thinkers who one might engage with if one were to pursue that aspect of uh, enhancing transformative theology. The next area where psychology, I think, might help, and to an extent this also applies to neuroscience, is in making theology somewhat humbler in its claims. And I think through that, um, I'm talking about uh, natural, psychological and neuroscientific accounts of self-transcendent experiences. And this is a broad range of experiences that include dramatic mystical experiences, but uh, also all sorts of other sorts of experiences that we might think of as spiritually significant um, or slightly strange or anomalous. And there has been a tendency both amongst um, scientists and theologians to treat these natural accounts of these experiences. So these are accounts which might either talk in terms of the areas of the brain that are active when we have these experiences, or the psychological processes that are involved in altered states of consciousness and so on. There has been a tendency in the past to look at these as reductionist. So to suggest that when we have a natural account of these types of experience, we are explaining them away. 
But I would want to argue that that is not necessarily the case. I think these experiences can be used, these uh, um, uh, forms of analysis can be used to enhance an account of uh, these kinds of experiences, to enrich them, um, to show the way that God works in the embodied and embrained human person to uh, reveal God's self to us. And it does um, push against, and is quite a good corrective, a healthy corrective, I think, to use uh, the tendency that you sometimes see to use the phenomenology of an experience to determine its epistemic status. So to put that in less long words, um, to assume that because an experience is weird, that it is inherently spiritually significant. And these naturalistic accounts, which bring extraordinary experiences under the, under the umbrella of all experiences, um, including experiences uh, that uh, are part of mental health conditions, um, have a kind of leveling effect. And um, the natural kind of consequence of that argument is that it relocates the revelation of God uh, in all forms of human activity and experience. And when one when, when then wants to go on and make a theological judgment about its divine origins or its divine significance, one does that in terms of the content of the experience or the fruit of the experience in a person's life or the life of a community rather than its form. Um, so I've put as one of the key thinkers there, slightly mischievously, the poet George Herbert, who essentially talks about heaven in the most ordinary aspects, present in the most ordinary aspects of human life or the redeemed human life. It's uh, about the way uh, the ordinary is reframed rather than necessarily um, valorizing the extraordinary or the weird as inherently revelatory. So that's making theology a little bit humbler. And the next one I want to mention is this idea of retrieving a heartfelt theology. And I think there has been a move in psychology and indeed in theology itself uh, recently to start to bring um, uh, affective knowing, to bring the heart back into the practice of thinking about God. And this goes with the move towards embodied cognition, to understand the thing that all our thinking happens in our bodies and through our bodies. We are not kind of um, immaterial spirits or um, brains that float about outside of our bodies, but we are integrated beings. Um, but also that our thinking doesn't have to be cold and rational in order to be valid, and that we have certain modes of thinking, affect-laden modes of thinking, that can lead us into uh, truth in a different yet complementary kind of way to the more traditional rationalist ways of doing both theology and indeed the study of uh, psychology. And the way that, that psychology is, has helped us understand that is through delineating different modes of thinking that we engage with. Uh, and one way of talking about that is to talk about the difference between propositional thinking, that is rational uh, thinking that can be expressed very clearly in propositions um, and implicational thinking, which is much more intuitive, much more difficult to express in propositions, easier to express in poetry, uh, for example. Um, that uh, it, it, it is, it, it, but also tells us very, very important things about the way the world is, particularly the world of human relationships. And ways into that are, and this is the second on the slide, um, understanding, for example, the psychology of play, um, understanding the importance of narrative and poetry, understanding um, the insights we get from the way that children learn. And just to come back, you know, to the first Christian theologian, Jesus himself, this is a very important part of his own teaching. 
uh, about getting inside the mind and the propensities of a young child. But also, I personally have learned a lot from uh, being alongside people living with dementia uh, and the way that they tune into truth. Um, and uh, some of that has been there in psychology of religion for a, a, a few years now. And a, a distinction that is a really important distinction between the way that we psychologically represent God, as it were, in our heads, um, as a representation or a concept that is um, largely mediated by this intuitive, affect-laden way of knowing. And um, how that's distinct from the kind of God we talk about in the creeds or in the doctrines that we write. And um, often this God is uh, influenced, if not determined, by our experience with our uh, parents as small children. So our capacity to trust God um, may be very strongly influenced by whether our parents were trustworthy. Our capacity to relate to God as our father is going to be influenced by our early experience. And that's quite distinct from any doctrinal statements we want to make about the fatherhood of God. And so what psychology can do there perhaps is to help us pull these things apart um, and give us a bit more precision about uh, in what mode we are talking of God. You remember that um, Ruard Ganzevort was talking about theology as um, discourses about God. We have different modes of talking about God, and these are embedded in our psychological process. And so, uh, finally, I want to uh, talk about making theology kinder uh, and spend just a little bit more time on that. And what I mean by making theology kinder is to get a better understanding of the distinction between sin and human limitation or situatedness. Um, and one area, I think, over the last century or so, where we've made uh, advances in that is in the area of mental health and in understanding that a lot of conditions that we might have talked about in moral terms in the past, we now tend to use a medical or a psychological lens to uh, uh, describe. And in some ways, pe some people will, will, might say, well, we've gone a bit too far with that. Um, but uh, for example, the sort of um, self-loathing that people experience when they are depressed, we now understand is distinct from a, um, a, a spiritual state where one looks at the self rationally and understands um, one's shortcomings and has remorse over them through the theological lens. These are different kinds of things. And the approach to managing um, depression uh, is not one that is heavily theologically um, freighted anymore, but it would have been. And I'm suggesting also that we might do something a bit like that for the idea of unconscious bias, which is something that's crept into our vocabulary more recently. And the people that I think one might engage with here, I put as suggestions, and I put their books up, is first of all, uh, two people called Justin Barrett and Pamela Epstein King, who are both psychologists and a couple of years ago wrote a book called uh, Thriving with Stone Age Minds, where they brought evolutionary psychology uh, into conversation with Christian theology. And, uh, and then a theologian um, called Matthew Crossman, who wrote a really interesting book uh, about the letter to the Romans um, on the idea of sin as an emergent property. Uh, and I'll come back to that shortly. So sin as something that emerges. Uh, so Crossman kind of says, sin in the letter to the Romans, sin starts as a kind of um, description of actions and um, it then starts to uh, become a kind of cause 
of what's wrong with people. And finally, it grows legs uh, and becomes almost personal. Um, and it's very interesting to uh, see what Paul is doing there with the idea of sin as he tries to delineate the human condition and why Jesus had to die and raise to make things right. So I'm going to um, look at, um, uh, in particular, the idea of um, tribalism, which is something that we have uh, uh, received as part of our evolutionary heritage. Um, and that has a shadow side, and the shadow side is sectarianism. And I'm just going to uh, unpack that in a little bit more detail. So here is some psychology of religion findings, and I'm putting them in a very, very oversimplified way just to make my point. And the first is some of the things we know over the years from studies in the area of psychology of religion about how religious people behave. And this is a um, quote from a psychologist of religion, David Wolfe, and it's quite an old quote, but essentially it remains um, applicable the subsequent research has nuanced it a bit, but it's a very important take home message from a lot of the research. So he says this, using a variety of methods to measure piety, religious affiliation, church attendance, doctrinal orthodoxy, the rated importance of religion and so on, researchers have consistently found positive correlations with ethnocentrism, dogmatism, social distance, rigidity, intolerance of ambiguity, and specific forms of prejudice, especially against Jewish people and as well as Blacks. So there is this very large literature on psychology and negative attitudes, sorry, religion and negative attitudes to outgroups. It's problematic. Secondly, some more optimistic um, research, positives that seem to be associated with religion. Again, using a variety of methods to measure piety, researchers have consistently found a positive association with better mental and physical health and longevity. So here, religion seems to be coming out quite well. And a positive association between religiosity and pro-sociality, that is, good deeds, morality. But this is moderated by who you are helping. Religious participants in studies tend to help members of their in-groups over other groups, especially when you do economic simulation games where they have little information about the stranger. So they help their friends more than their strain, more than people they don't know. And um, I expect most of you now then are bringing to mind the story, Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan, which is a, a challenge to that tendency in religious people. And indeed, uh, those of you who studied any psychology of religion will know there's a very famous experiment that involves uh, rerunning the story of the Good Samaritan to see if religious people really do help strangers or not. Um, and I won't tell you about the results of that study at this point. But you can ask in the questions if you'd like to. So what is going on here? Why does it seem to be that religious people seem to be more negatively disposed to groups outside their own community than the average person, but also more healthy? And one reason might be the social nature of groups. So there is um, a theory in psychology of religion or in psychology called social identity theory, which is looking at the way that when we belong to a group, it gives us all sorts of benefits, um, but there are some costs associated with that. So the benefits are a sense of um, solidarity, um, uh, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, all the things that we crave. And religious faith groups offer us a lot of that. They offer us a story that um, helps us make meaning. Um, all sorts of things, uh, friendships, um, a, a common moral code, all sorts of things that are good for us. Um, 
But what happens when people bond in these groups is that they tend to um, a mindset that favors the group. The more they are uh, become deeper involved in the group, the more they favor their group and differentiate their group from others. And that's particularly the case if they start to feel under threat. And so you have um, a, a tendency to uh, think your, your group is better than others. You have a tendency to draw a distinction between your group and others. Um, and these things help you maintain your self-worth as an individual and a group by comparing yourself negatively to the other group. So to take it away from religion for a moment, think about how uh, football supporters uh, maintain their self-identity, a sense of self-worth. Very often it's pointing the finger um, at another group. Um, I observed this in my own family with their reactions to the Liverpool-Everton match last night. And one of the ways you do this is to stereotype the people who are outside your group negatively and stereotype the people who are inside your group positively. And what seems to be the case is that with religious groups, these kind of processes get amplified. Um, and some of the reasons are that there's a richness of symbolism available to you. You uh, can adopt uh, an identity marker that is, is uh, very visible. So in the next slide, I've just got some examples of that. Very clear from uh, clothing, from the what you do with your body in terms of bodily appearance, but also um, the behaviors that mark your group out as um, distinctive, make you visibly or openly part of that group. And if you think back to the really unfortunate altercation um, between the uh, Metropolitan Police last week and um, a, a Jewish gentleman, he was told you are uh, openly Jewish. I think they actually meant you are visibly Jewish. Um, that there are identity markers that go with religion that, that really do the job of saying, this is me and this is my group. And so this um, enhances these um, uh, this sense of group solidarity that makes you feel good if you're in but tends to make you um, more wary of, at the very least, or hostile to others. So that's the symbolism and the identity markers that are visible. But I've also put on this slide, another thing that religion does is it, invo it invokes a kind of purity pollution dimension. So you get the idea of what's clean and holy is inside and what is outside is dirty or contagious. And to keep your group identity strong, you um, may need to separate yourself from what you want. Right. A lot of the um, discourse on um, ordained ministry is often about being set apart, for example, or being called to holiness or a deeper holiness of life. So to be clear, I'm not criticizing this, but I'm saying that um, this is what makes these groups, religious groups, particularly distinctive and perhaps then particularly prone to um, the costs associated with that distinctiveness. And you can get a uh, disgust at stuff that is um, impure and you can get a fear of the danger of contamination by those who are outside the group. And finally, some groups um, uh, which have a very strong identity base this in a particular sacred text, which then becomes the uh, fundamental source, perhaps the exclusive source or a certain reading of that text becomes the exclusive source for what you um, uh, understand your identity to be and cannot be contradicted by anything outside of it. So you have this intratextual echo chamber at work. So there was a psychologist of religion who was very famous, um, who was working mainly in the 20th century called Gordon Allport. And he um, made this, again, very famous statement about the paradox of religiosity. And uh, it was this. He said, the role of religion is paradoxical. It makes prejudice and it unmakes prejudice. 
while the creeds of the great religions are universalistic, all stressing brotherhood, the practice of these creeds is frequently divisive and brutal. The sublimity of religious ideals is offset by the horror of persecution in the name of these same ideals. Churchgoers are more prejudiced than the average, and they are also less prejudiced than the average. So it, in a sense, he's saying this is a mess. And it, that statement reminds me a lot of um, Paul in Romans 7, when he's talking about the nature of the law and how the law is a good thing and it enables us to do good. And yet somehow it has trapped us in a place that um, is not good. And it's deeply paradoxical. And he gets into such a um, complexity of argumentation in the end. He just says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me? Um, so there's a kind of theological counterpart to the psychological slightly mess that I've just pre presented to you. And there are two, at least, possible psychological ways, perhaps, of um, untangling the mess. And I'm just going to flag them both to you now before I uh, stop. The first is distinguishing the psychological form of a belief from its ideological context. So, for example, this is something some psychologists of religion have done, distinguishing fundamentalism from orthodoxy. So they treat fundamentalism as a form of belief, but the content, orthodoxy, is something that is primarily theological and outside the scope of psychology. And the second thing I'm going to look at is the niche gap. So I'm going to start simply with this idea that you might be able to distinguish the form, the psychological form of a belief from its content. And um, one psychologist uh, defined uh, fundamentalism for the purposes of psychology, not by its content, but by its style. And he said this, uh, it's uh, a uh, belief that there is one set of religious teaching that is clearly carries the fundamental, basic, essential, inerrant truth about humanity and God or the gods. And this essential truth is understood to be opposed by forces of evil and ignorance, which must be vigorously fought against. And this system must be followed today, according to unchangeable practices of the past. And that those who believe this system have a special relationship with the divine. So it's a style of belief. And a few years ago, um, my husband and I wrote a book about um, Richard Dawkins in which we suggested that his style of atheism was a fundamentalist style because it was rather like this description. So in this next slide, I've simply suggested that you might uh, lay out the content of a belief along one dimension and the form of a belief along the other. And you might get some interesting um positions, uh, and I've put them in four quadrants for convenience sake. So you might get people who were um, fundamentalist in style and orthodox in content, and it would be quite easy to think of people we know like that, and that's in the top right-hand quadrant. And in the bottom left, I've got the kind of counterpoint to that, which is they're people who psychologically are more open, fluid, questing about life, and to hold a liberal or progressive form of uh, theology or politics. And they're the least interesting. The interesting positions are on the other diagonal. Um, you can get people who have a progressive or liberal ideology, but who hold it in a fundamentalist way. And I think we've all encountered people like that. Or on the bottom right, you could have people with a very uh, orthodox, traditionalist ideological content who do hold it in an open, questing, inquiring, uh, curious way. So one thing that we might draw out is the difference between the content and the form 
of uh, religion, uh, not tar all traditionalists as fundamentalist thinkers, nor assume that all progressives are open-minded, questing thinkers. So to distinguish the psychology, psychological form from the theological content, and that might help us in exploring the uh, difficulties with the fact that uh, religious people can often seem to be um, more rigid and more prejudiced than the general public. And then finally, um, another way of addressing this problem, which I think is interesting, um, and this is picking up on the book by Barrett and uh, King, this idea of the niche gap. And they, writing from an evolutionary perspective, suggest that like all creatures, human beings evolve to fit their biological niche. We've done this over millennia. But unlike other animals, we have uniquely developed the capacity to construct a niche to suit the demands of a given situation. So we might construct rules, uh, social structures as part of that. And that constructed niche can not only become outdated, and this is naturally going to happen as times change and plant, the planet changes and society changes, that could, our niche can not only become outdated, it can become problematic for later generations. And perhaps tribalism and its cultural elaborations are an example. But tribalism is something that works well in terms of our evolutionary heritage, but perhaps can work against us now and clearly does on certain occasions. And um, I guess I, when I've thought about this more theologically, I've thought about Paul and his notion of the works of the law or the things that are added to the law that is given, which might in times past have served the people of Israel well, but in the present time, the eschatological moment that he's actually talking about has become counterproductive and problematic for them. And tribalism certainly is one of the things that runs through the New Testament. So coming back, and this is my last slide, to um, uh, unconscious bias, for example. And this is just my final example, really. Unconscious bias probably has arisen because it did us good in our evolutionary past. And in fact, probably still does us quite a lot of good. Um, but that it raises all sorts of problems in our modern, multicultural, diverse society. It's, a, it's psychologically problematic. But I would want to suggest that perhaps it isn't inherently sinful. It's part of our human condition that is our biological heritage. And so our attitude to it should be that we need to manage it rather than to try and atone for it as a moral shortcoming. And therefore, uh, this management could be marked by self-compassion rather than self-criticism. Yet having said that, and this is where the emergence of sin is so interesting, something like the tendency to unconscious bias against people who are not part of our in-group, which we all have and we all need to survive, and we certainly have needed in our evolutionary history, makes us prone to sin. It makes us prone as individuals and societies to, for example, racism. So this is very uh, subtle, I think, interplay between our biological and psychological heritage and substantive, um, theologically significant aspects of who we are. But I think if we bring psychology into a focused conversation with theology, we might unpack uh, in a way that uh, tells us when we need to be stern with ourselves and uncompromising, and when a little bit of kindness uh, and acknowledgement that we are biological creatures um, will be more appropriate. So I'm going to stop at that point, and um, if anybody wants to pick up any of these things during the uh, Q&A, uh, you're um, very welcome to do that. So I'm just going to get rid of my screen now. Thank you, Joanna, for a most interesting and thought-provoking talk.
Now we have 20 minutes of um, question and answer. Who wants to go first? Any? You have to um, add mute to ask any questions. Uh, I can see Millie, unmute. Millie, do you want to ask a question? Unmute. Yes, yes, I can ask. Um, I, I thank you very much, uh, Professor Joanna. Um, I this is beautifully set up. Would you be willing to share with us the emerging edges of your work, given the understanding of what you've just given us? Just a tidbit in the answer of the edges where you are continuing to go deeper. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess research-wise, the area that I've been most interested in has been the transformation of trauma. And um, okay. uh, I'm, I'm interested in that. I guess it raises a theological question because the, tra the transformation of trauma to, to good is something that um, psychologists have become rather late in the day um, attuned to. Uh, and because it connects with a lot of stuff more broadly in the natural and biological world about the, the fact that we die, things die in order to live. Um, uh, I guess it raises for me ideas about a, a form of natural theology. A natural theology is not a particularly um, popular concept. Um, right. But right. Uh, I think there is something to be looked at about the kind of cruciform shape of the natural world. And Jesus' own um, readiness to draw on nature, especially to talk about uh, the transformation of death to life. So that's an area that I'm kind of keep thinking about and have written a bit about and keep researching. But I think I would say that mostly the sorts of things I've been talking about inform pastoral encounters. Um, in my parish ministry and a bit more broadly, um, to, for instance, navigating the, that discernment process between when one should be engaged in heavy self-criticism and when one should be saying, I'm a human being and uh, I offer this to God. Because if you get overly engaged in self-analysis and self-criticism, you actually perhaps are doing more harm uh, than good because you're paying attention to the thing you should be actually sitting much more likely to in order to, to discern the voice of the spirit. So those are some of the areas that I have. It's in. beautiful. You have a real hand on this. Um, in, the trauma, in the trauma area, you know, the idea, if you go theologically, is the human is healing, isn't it? The history of healing and learning through the scriptures, what that might be almost mystically. But, but I'd like to the discussion of the self and the human, because I'm a spiritual guide and that's where it really lies, is the self and the human, because the development of the self is theological in, <laughs> in my studies, you know, this kind of thing. But um, I wondered if you could say just a little bit more about the last statement where you call it a workable bias or what did you call that? I can't remember what you named that. I thought that was quite good and can uh, be taken further. Um I'm just aware there's more people who are wanting to ask questions. Yeah. So Thank you. Uh, I probably Thank you. ought to get to attend to them. Thank, Thank you, dear. Thank you very Thank much. You, Bye -bye. There is Anna Abram. Uh, you have to unmute. Anna, unmute. Yes, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm muted. Joanna, thank you so much. It's just so lovely to, to hear you and listen to your uh, amazing talk and I love the way you set it up uh, against that uh, plat uh, platonic framework of truth um, justice and, and beauty and definitely you leave that to the third and, and largely to the first two um, th this may be a, um, going to be a huge question but I wonder if we can reverse uh, your your theme is there anything or what anything in particular in your view can theology or good theology 
to bring to a better psychology. And I have invested interest in this question because being in a theological institution, I'm trying to make theology relevant. So I wonder if, if, if you could comment a little bit on this. Um, yeah, I think there's lots that theology can can bring. Um, well, I'm thinking about Christ. Well, maybe perhaps other faiths too, but Christian theology primarily. Um, uh, one example I think would be where theology has helped, uh, and I, I think it's been a resource, for example, for positive psychology. Um, that uh, positive psychology has been enriched by ideas from Christian theology, though some people would say it's rather plundered uh, or cherry picked what it wanted from Christian theology. But and within within that, an area I think that has worked really well has been, uh, I think psychologists now have a much better understanding of the nature of humility than um, they did previously. I think there was a tendency to think that humility and low self-esteem and low self-worth were the same thing to not attend to humility, to assume it was pathological when people tried to be uh, appropriately self-critical, um, certainly in therapy, but also I think in academic writing. But in the last 20 years or so, psychologists have understood that humility is a healthy thing uh, and delineated more clearly what its aspects are and distinguished that from a kind of depressive, uh, low self-worth uh, uh, um, obsession with 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 failure and unworthiness and brokenness um and in that sense i think theology has really helped uh both mm -hmm. therapy uh and there's a parallel thing about forgiveness i would say as well that it that has, that has, that has helped um but then the conversation can go both ways because i think then the, the psychology that has starts to pull that apart in the light of theology can then be taken back into a, a church pastoral setting where you can identify where in fact um, perhaps practitioners, religious practitioners, priests and lay ministers and so on, don't get the difference between, for example, theology and low self-worth in, in the pastoral care that they give to their congregants. So that's an example. Thank you very much. Really good. Thank you. Now we've got Paul. Paul Kennedy. Hello. It's a uh... Uh, Paul, you've got other to say, or, or do you? Sorry, it's Michael McClure, former, uh, some of you may remember me, sort of. Um, but thank you very much, firstly, for your very thought-provoking and intelligent analysis of uh, psychology and religion. However, there's some things that slightly worry me. There are aspects of religious practice which are often considered deleterious, not good, and yet they have played a, played a positive role in national and ethnic identity, such as the strong, the strength of Jewish family life um, and the Jewish identity. Also, the preservation of national identity through religion. I'm thinking of Ireland and Poland, where Catholicism has played an important part in establishing the distinctiveness of a nationalism. Even, even in England, where the Church of England traditionally always thought that God was an Englishman. Uh, or let us think of Greek nationalism, where orthodoxy was seen as a way of preserving national identity against an oppressive Islamic regime. Now, these all characteristics may be seen, such the narrowness of sometimes Jewish life, they seem as deeply unpositive, and yet they very much stem from theology and the sense of community. How do you reconcile what you might see as the downsides of all this with a positive sense of identity? Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, th I think that's the, the dilemma is that that this is a positive thing that somehow has these negative, well, what I've called loosely a shadow side or negatives that go with it. Um, uh, and I don't I don't think they're, you know, automatically linked in a linear way. But broadly speaking, the more the positives, the more the danger of the negatives. Um and I, I think, I mean, I mean, this is very grandiose of me but uh, to say this, but one way I think about the work of Christ is as kind of squaring that circle and um, offering a model of all the things you described, um, the belonging, the identity, um, the connectedness, uh, all the beautiful things without that shadow side through this um command to to treat your out group as if it were your in group and 
um, there's something, uh, it's such a great cost because it's very hard to square that circle or balance balance that tension, however you think of it. Perhaps it's impossible humanly. Um, uh, but I think it's I think it's 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 central, maybe not the central, but a really central part of the work of Christ is to address that conundrum. And it's to do it through this command to uh, love your enemy, uh, to treat the stranger as if they were family, to instead of um, increasing uh, the value of your community um, by excluding the other to increase the value of your community by including the other. And I, and I, I think that, and, and, and because that, precisely because that is so hard, if not impossible, it takes him to the cross. And that's kind of my kind of reading of it, I think. And I think it's, it's, it's a way, it's, a, it's a, one of the many lenses you can approach Pauline theology of the atonement through, because Paul is so big on tribalism, identity markers, who is in, who is out, uh, the need for uh, faith rather than um, uh, circumcision uh, or any other kind of identity marker as um, the uh, identifier of who you belong to. So that's a bit of a long answer, but I think it's a really good question. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's presented as a psychological question, but I think it's a theological question. Oh, well, we can Thank you, Joanna. I'm looking around. Any more questions? That should have a question. Yeah. That's me. That's what happened. It suddenly happened. Paul, you have more questions? We lost. lost. Could right. I ask a question, please, please, Violetta? Yes. Jo Joanna, I really love that diagram um, that you drew about um, the content and the structure and form. Have you written a paper on it at all? Is there anything that you could let me have to look at, the, look at that more closely? I found that really interesting. Um, I don't think I have, no. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's kind of... Uh... If I were to write a paper on it, I'd have to be a lot more rigorous than I was uh, the way I mm. presented it to you. Um, mm. It really is the sort of thing that it, it's a little bit in beyond what you'd say when you went to the pub with some people for a chat. But it's not a lot more beyond that. And, and mm. so I, what I think is, I think it's I've used it a lot with students. I think it's a, a helpful way of disentangling some things. It's a helpful way of, of naming stuff sometimes and the way that we misread people. So we might misread somebody as having quite a kind of progressive content because of their open style, uh, when in fact they may be actually quite traditionalist. Um, it's a bit like the, um, the way we conflate people agreeing with us, with them liking us. Um, and I, I, I think, uh, it, you know, um, some more work probably needs to be done on it. I'm not the only person who's drawn that distinction, but I have not published anything on it, and I don't think I have any plans to do so. Um, but the thing that seems to help people most about that uh, diagram is the idea of kind of fundamentalist progressives. Um, uh, just the idea that you could hold those two things that seem mm. be in that place, be in that space. Um, yeah, And I, th I think the really clear thing to say, and this is important, uh, it, is that this is not types of people. It's kind of places we find ourselves in through life. Sometimes we are more prone to think fundamentalistly because we're under stress, for example, um, mm. rather than there are types of people who, who uh, occupy those positions. Mm. I thought it was really perceptive and I'd love there to be a paper on it, but you're not to going to do it, it anytime <laughs> soon, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. Anyway, right. thank you. Thank you, Joanna. We've come to the end of your talk. I'd like to thank you so very much for coming to us. And okay. if we are mute, we can show our appreciation. <laughs>